Hey, welcome to the Today Dreamer podcast. If it's your first time here, Today Dreamer is all about creating a space where we can cultivate with one another the practice of presence in our lives and really explore what, you know, a deeper participation into the emergent world story looks like for us. How can we more deeply participate and contribute um, in this kind of collective journey? So, uh, today is part two of a conversation I had with Stephen Buhner. If you haven't had a chance yet, I would definitely listen into and feel into part one uh, before kind of jumping into this one. Um, but yeah, let's get into it, and I hope you love the show. There's one place in all the universe that's been made especially for you, and it's inside your own feet. Nobody expects the poem to go there, but there's a certain grounding dynamic that happens when you suddenly realize that there's this special place that's been made exactly for you. And it's different than every other place. But most people aren't really grounded in their bodies like that, so it's kind of a shock for them. And there's sort of this shifting of orientation when that last line is heard. Yeah, I I feel like it's kind of pointing to... It's interesting you said that because what you were kind of... um, kind of describing just prior it seems what came to me was this idea of walking and then the path will reveal itself and um the walk itself it's like a a reminder of that that kind of you you gave me a really beautiful reminder and i'm sure everyone listening will feel the same is is that that idea of just kind of um moving into that or trusting and moving into and you know, because sometimes I feel like what can happen is I I realize that and, it, and 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 then I forget it. And when I forget it, it's like it's like I imagine how things are going to play out, and it never fits right, and it stops me from it. Kind of stunts my movement. And right. when I remember and I move, it kind of almost takes care of itself as long as there's there's a kind of. Um, presence involved and 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 a, and a like a subtle the noticing the subtlety of the experience just to kind of gently pull on that thread and when you kind of shared that poem just now it's beautiful that you brought it back into this kind of embodied feeling and back into the feet which kind of for me reminds me of the walking right and so there's you know gandhi had this great thing he would say he said you know the 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 step and the destination are the same thing. They're meant to be the same thing. So that, and what he's talking about is that there's a quality that has to be in the step in every step you take. And if that quality is in the step that you take, then the destination is always assured. It doesn't mean that things are going to turn out well. It doesn't mean yeah. you're not going to get old or be sick or, suffer hardships but you know and Stafford said that he said the thing is all those things are still going to happen but you never let go of the thread people ask what you're doing and you you tell them that you're following the thread they don't really understand what you mean you know but it's like you have a hold of this thing that's invisible another way he put it was he called it actually riding the Australian crawl he said which is a kind of a swimming stroke he said people that stand on the bank watch us move our hands and bodies through an invisible medium and we go from here to there, but they can't see how we do it because the thread is, can only be felt. It can't be seen. Mm. And so it just takes time to develop the acuity of sensitivity that you need and to continue to follow the thread. And that basically means you make a zillion mistakes. You know, a friend of mine, uh, the writer John Dunning, is a mystery writer, he said, when I was starting out, he said, you know, every writer's got a million words of bullshit in them, and the only way to get it out is to write it out. And so over time, then what happens is there's less and less bullshit that you write. 
so it gets closer and closer to a final form because you've gotten used to what the right words feel like as they're laid down in the line. But it's the same way moving through life that you, um, and all of these kind of uh, serendipities tend to occur when you're following that feeling sense like that through the world. And you might say somebody gives their love to that aesthetic sensibility and that's what they decide to follow in life. But it quite often happens that you can't talk about it with very many people because most people don't do that. Most people are doing other things. And yet at the same time, you can't really take your eye off of the need to make a living, for to have food to eat, mm. to have you know, people that you love and that love you and, you know, all of those kinds of things that we need in that sense. And my goal a long time ago was to figure a way to get paid <laughs> for, for following my aesthetic sense. Right? Yeah. So yeah, mine too. to get paid for writing or to get paid for the performance art that people thought I was, that it was a lecture, <laughs> you are, you know, um, the woodworking that I did when I did that for a long time, but uh, it always entailed lifting a lot of heavy things and breathing weird dust. So, you know, I much prefer <laughs> writing and and talking. Yeah. So, the interesting questions come up. Um, yeah, and I, so many things I, I really want to ask you about. Um, just about kind of the parallels between our journeys, because it seems like. There's quite a lot of them, uh, it's, it's, but what's coming up for me is this real curiosity around synchronicities and the link between the synchronicities or the or the, those serendipitous moments and the senses. Uh, I'm just yeah. and and maybe I don't know, like the, the frequency of them or um, how how they how they've maybe shown up on, along your journey and what your relationship to those moments is now. Um, I've just got a curiosity around that link and if if there's anything that comes up for you in that space. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, this brings up this this concept called gambler's ruin, because we really live, uh, life is non-linear, and it's not rational or irrational, it's non-rational. Okay, the universe is a non-rational place, and rationality can only get you so far, right? And if you stick with rationality, then, you know, it becomes kind of this desert that you're in. But in any event, for me there's always a life-threatening event that happens at every stage of life. When I was being born, at adolescence, middle age, and now the transition into old age. And so it sort of goes like this. So because at each stage, I'm becoming a different person. There's mm. new qualities of self that begin to emerge. Now, people can see that most easily in the transition from childhood to young adulthood and passing through that adolescent stage, mm -hmm. all of a sudden people become sexual beings. Well, that, that was a person that wasn't, wasn't there like five years ago, you yeah. know? And um, these other qualities of self, I mean, everybody recognizes this early teenager, you know, when they see it, and there's these kind of qualities, so a different sort of personality that's encoded in our biological organism, even though nobody can find exactly where it's located, <laughs> it sort of comes into being. And then, you know, there's a number of different ones. There's a lot of ones that happen very quickly in childhood. You know, the nine-month-old is real different than the, the two-year-old, different than the four-year-old, the three-year-old's different. So you've got these sort of developmental stages, but each one has sort of a different personality to it and different capacities, different ways of interacting. You know, the two-year-old has this very strong will, you know, that's important in life, for instance. But then you get these 16-year-olds, and then in middle age, they talk about this middle age shift, and there's a lot of jokes made about it, um, you know, both toward both men and women, but a different kind of personality comes into play there, too. And another one at, um, when you go into old age, so, the way it works for me is, you know, the transition periods are rough. I always get really sick. Things are really messy. Yeah. And then they, things begin to kind of settle out, and I begin to um, find my way and get my balance with it. 
And since I'm doing it from this sort of aesthetic orientation, then because these other qualities or personalities come into being, I have to get to know them and sort of integrate better. I'm not the way I was, you know, five years ago or anything. And so I do, and then I start to find my balance with it. So I'm moving through the world and following this, these aesthetic senses through the world, um, whether it's, you know, I have an idea for a book and I start seeking out, for instance, I start sort of orienting my thinking and my feeling around this new book that I'm working on. And oddly enough, as time goes on, there's this weird synchronicity that starts to occur. That I go to a friend's house and I sit down and there is the exact book I need is sitting on their table. I pick it up and read it and I go, huh, that's exactly, this is exactly what I needed as a resource. Or I find one on a park bench. Or, you know, I'm talking to somebody and they go, oh, have you read such and so, right? And so then maybe I'll do, be doing research on the internet, finding, trying to find, you know, something that I'm looking for. And all of a sudden, this, it's almost like a little door opens, and I just find this rich trove of stuff. And then people start to call me to have me teach, and it becomes these really magical moments and it's just like eventually it seems as if I can do no wrong I mean literally everything I do is like perfect you know and I love those moments I love those periods of time and that'll go on for a long time and it's sort of when I, they occur when I'm most sort of present and balanced in this particular thread that I happen to be following at that time well, sorry what do you mean by that most present and balanced what do you mean by um with well, the thread for instance, that okay so so when a writer's writing a book if they're really a serious writer and they've done it for a while they know how the territory goes pretty soon everything is about the book literally the book becomes real and the rest of life becomes almost dreamlike Okay, and all of life becomes a metaphor for the book itself. And so what happens is it's, it's as if the story that's emerging from you in the book begins to almost pull you toward certain events or those events towards you. Hmm. So that, you know, to back, I'll back up a little bit, when writers write... When a writer sits down to write, they enter a dream world. They enter a kind of a specific kind of a dream state. They begin dreaming, and the story comes through them and flows onto the page. And then when later we buy the book and read it, we enter the dream that the writer dreamed. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. See? And so, but as a writer immerses themselves more and more in a particular book they literally are in this dreaming state all of the time. And so I've, I've done that where I've been in the middle of it. I go to the post office, I'm in line and there's a guy in front of me that I know quite well. I've known him for like 20 years. And I, he goes, hi, how are you doing? I look at him, I go, who are you? <laughs> you know, it's like, and he goes, it's me, Michael. And then all of a sudden I click and I go, oh yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing and time has no meaning either. So I'm so immersed in that, that, you know, I might be focused on some um, aspect of the book, for instance. Uh, um, I, I mean, I can't even think of an example right now. And I'm like struggling to solve some problem of the story mm -hmm. that I'm telling. And I just am sort of in that spot. And for whatever reason, both my, my deep unconscious, my dreams, the things I encounter in life, they all sort of converge together to bring that solution forward. Uh, whether I find it in a book on a friend's table or else, you know, a lot of times if I stop 
and I, you know, vacuum the floor or something or wash the windows or do something like that and change my focus, all of a sudden it's like the deep unconscious keeps working on it and all of a sudden the whole thing just bursts right into awareness of its own accord. All writers talk about that sort of thing and uh, when I was doing woodworking and creating one-of-a-kind pieces, the same I was searching for the form that would happen then too. So it gets to be this sort of dance where it's as if I and the outside world collaborate together to create this thing. Do you feel like that's happening on if you zoom out a little bit in terms of the guy and heart and mind in and kind of these these little inspirations and um, I guess vibes that that have felt kind of and these different kind of waves that move through the collective in terms of um, kind of common points of well, for harmony. Me, I think about it. I think about it in a very non-reductive, mechanical, okay. rationalist, non-sort of monotheistic frame. Yeah. To me, everything's alive. I live in an animist universe, and to me, I'm just that capacity that I had as a child is pretty much completely reclaimed. To me, everything has a personality and everything is communicating with me all of the time. It's so I'm embedded in this field of interaction. I'm not like this isolated intelligence on a ball of resources mm-hmm. circling around the sun, you know, and there is this sort of connectivity uh, uh, an emotional, but a kind of a feeling connectivity between me and everything else. So, and that's really actually an accurate ecological statement because we emerge out of Earth itself into an ecological matrix, uh, a living, um, it's this living field of meaning that the earth has been generating for four and a half billion years and it generates all of these different forms and every form that emerges is done so for an ecological reason it's not happenstance that whole it happens by accident stuff is what you know (laughs) weird rationalists make up but that's not the way it works so could you maybe just talk about i don't know if you're open to the idea and even through poetry might be interesting but the the stages that you went through of moving from this kind of narcissistic um place where tendencies in that area might be coming up to becoming more of this kind of earth speaking on behalf of itself in your life yeah well the problem becomes with this yeah is that you're leaving the house that rationality built for you and people can tell Now, some people find it um, intriguing and they want to spend time and find out more about it, and other people become very offended, (laughs) you know. And so um, the thing that I didn't realize when I began is that I was becoming other, you see, because living this kind of life, it's different than what the Western cultures are doing. It's more akin to what indigenous cultures that haven't had a lot of contact with the outside world do. They live in an animate world where everything is alive and communicating with them. And there's uh, uh, conversations that occur and sharings that occur. So for me to reclaim that sense, you know, it's like I call it the journey back to wild water because when I was very young. I spent a lot of time with my great-grandfather on a farm in Indiana, and we would fish and and lay in this pond and and just be with each other. And he loved me so much I could feel that sort of feel the love surrounding me. And I kind of took it in me, you know, this kind of soul essence from the 19th century of this man. And um, one day he leaned over and cupped his hand under the water and said, have you ever tasted this water? It's really good. And it's the first time I ever remember tasting wild water. But you see, of course, my mother caught me drinking wild water not long after and told me it would kill me. 
And so I began to be afraid of wild water. So the journey back to wild water is a long one because there's this, we're trained to be afraid of what's out there. Um, I don't really know why. There's lots of <laughs> fantasies about that. But so when I started following this thread, eventually I had two warring realities inside me. One, this animist world, and the other, the sort of rational mechanical world that said, oh, we're just chemical interactions and, you know, consciousness is an illusion. And Yeah, the vibe you know, of the space between worlds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's really literally sort of this gulf that you end up having to cross. And one time when I was really beginning to really leave that whole rationalist mechanical world behind experientially, there was this woman, a mentor I went to, her name is Nan DeGrove, and she, you know, and I was very upset, and I talked and talked and talked for a long time, and then she just looked at me and she said, oh, oh, I see, you're, you're, you've been being a bridge, haven't you? Well, that's nice. But the only problem with being a bridge is that you yourself never get to cross over. I've read that in your book. I don't know. I, I just, I need more information in that space. This is, I feel like I'm almost you and you're almost her. And you're saying this through her in a way to me. <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I don't, I'm not quite but like. if you look at it, if there's this chasm yeah. between these two worlds. Yeah. And as I was spending more time learning about that other world and sort of exploring it. Um, but I was still staying pretty much in the rational world. I was explaining to everybody, well, look, there's this, see that great landscape over there and we can do all these things and isn't it wonderful? But really what was true is I was afraid to cross over because I instinctively knew that some um, differencing would occur if I did. And then when I realized that it was more a cowardice on my part rather than, yeah. you know, that I was actually being, you know, humanitarian and sure. helping everybody understand, <laughs> we lie to ourselves so, yeah. so cleverly. And so finally I just thought, well, what would happen if I just totally immersed myself in that other world? How though? Like, is that just, that's just, that's coming back to what we were saying about just okay, letting so go was, into the feeling. I quit trying to justify it. Can you tell me more about that? Quit justifying it. Sure. I just said, this is what I'm doing now. I'm following that aesthetic <sighs> sense and feeling wherever it goes. Yeah. Like so, fully, completely, not just kind of half, half and right. half. Yeah. And yeah, completely that it became my way of living and being and speaking and thinking and eating and everything. And so when I began to write, Everything that I was writing had to have that in it. I wasn't very good of a writer when I began. I was <laughs> extremely bad, actually. Yeah. And it took me a long time to figure out um, what writing really was and how to make it come alive. Was there a fear of because you were so bad? Like, did that kind of play into this cowardice sense? Like, no, the fear, the fear was uh, of saying out loud what I was experiencing and doing mm, okay. because I was basically saying um, that um, plants communicate with human beings. Now, if you tell most people that, they're going to think it's really weird. Gardeners, a lot of gardeners won't. A lot of farmers won't. But it depends what kind of farmer or gardener they are. But most people don't really think they think plant, plants are kind of this insentient background they can't you know they don't have any they aren't very intelligent you know and they can't really do anything but actually plants are probably one of the most intelligent species on the planet after bacteria and see so here we're already in a weird territory aren't we you know because i'm going well you know plants are a lot more intelligent than human beings people go yeah that's that's probably not true I mean, how much um, intelligence does it take to sneak up on a carrot anyway? <laughs> well, actually, the thing is that plant, plant roots, you know, people talk about our brain, but really the brain is irrelevant. What's relevant is the neural network that's housed in the brain. The brain's just the organ. 
so we have this neural network. People have seen pictures of it. It's in everything. It looks like this sort of, you know, uh, you know, these thin lines, you know, with these nodes and junctions and everything. Well, the thing is, plant roots are their brain, and they look exactly like the neural network in our brain. And they um, use the same neurochemicals we do. They have memories. They future plan. They are the best chemists on the planet. Um, a lot of those and uh, fungi, the fungal mats, the mycelium networks underneath the soil, they're the two best chemists on the planet, endlessly combining the molecules in these unique ways in response to environmental perturbations and human chemists for the most part just kind of study plants and then take their molecules and tweak them a little so they can get a patent and then make uh, drugs or whatever out of them we're um, copiers not originators and but we've been taught that plants aren't alive that they're really stupid you know and so that becomes a kind of a default dynamic for us. Um, but when I was studying, first really involving myself quite deeply in the study of medicinal plants, and I began looking at um, indigenous traditions all around the world, the interesting thing is every one of them, every single one that was asked, where did you learn the use of your plant medicine? Every one of them said it came in a dream, it came in a vision, or the plants told me. Okay, so you, what you have is you have these cultures all around the world that are geographically and temporally distinct from each other, all saying the same thing. Now, a real scientist would go, that's fascinating, and they would want to study it, but in fact, looking at the original texts of the ethnobotanists and anthropologists who um, interviewed these people, the very next thing they always said was, isn't it sad that these, they're just so like children, they're unchristian, you know, they just make up these things. Savages. You know? Yeah. And everybody would say that. And, you know, Christianity was very antithetical. They were very adversarial toward indigenous ways of thought and language and they spent along with governments a lot of time absolutely destroying that cosmology that they had encountered because they didn't understand it but then when you look at the uses that indigenous groups um, the medicinal uses of yarrow um, they all used it similarly and then so scientists study it and they actually find out after all these years and millions of dollars that yarrow does exactly what the tribal group said it did so basically what comes up for me then is that there's this other way to gather information about the universe than dissecting it and you know i'm curious about that how did they do that and it's rooted in sort of an animist perspective. And what really happens is the more you immerse yourself in this sort of living field of meaning that you're interacting with everything with that aesthetic sense fully developed, what happens is the field itself begins to um, share its nature with you. I mean, this is not not news to the Chinese poets, you know, or the, the Chinese mountain poets, or an ancient civilization, you know. Yeah, I don't want to sell them short. It's always a bad idea. But, you know, Basho, I think it was, that said, if you want to understand bamboo, go to the bamboo. If you want to understand the pine, go to the pine. And they would sit in contemplation with them for a long time until it shared its nature with them. They just use a different kind of language. It's exactly like shaping a pot. A pot that comes alive with that aesthetic sense has a quality to it where it communicates that to the uh, perceptive observer. And really, it all, all of it starts with just a feeling. 
Yeah, and just like in that restaurant, it's like an in- it just, intention to feel as well. Like, well, yeah, because it's sort of like, look, it's like a drug, okay? <laughs> it's like you just shot up the best heroin on the planet or something. You know, you start feeling this, um, this feeling thing, this uh, aesthetic sensibility. And it feels warm, and it feels rich, and it feels beautiful, and um, uh, uh, sensory. And, and immer- as you immerse yourself in it, your sensory field becomes much richer. The colors are much more vivid. Sounds become more exquisite. Uh, the surface of the body comes more alive. And it's like you basically, John C., the great Australian rainforest activist, refers to that as re-inhabiting our inner being with the world, you know. Yeah, it's just the word, it's just weird how like, you know, highways um, through language continually run over words and they they seem to lose their potency. But love comes up for me and like like almost like the core, uh, like some kind of central core of, and, and it just also brings up this thought of, you know the idea of cooking with love and and people taste that that exactly. love and also that what you shared around the skunk cabbage which i found right. so beautiful and and <laughs> so interesting um and then you know the process of sourcing the plant and then making a tincture with intention and love and and speaking to it and you know and then having that kind of cycle go back into itself as you kind of um right. became one with so yeah it just because it's and you're right, it's love and it feels good. See? Mm. And if you feel that good, why settle for second best <laughs> or third best? You know, so it becomes this sort of um, way of being that feels so much better than the other. And life itself begins to take on that richness and that depth, you know. So, and, you know, I mean, when you mentioned food, Everybody, I'm sure, has eaten a meal prepared by someone who's angry. (laughs) And when they do that, some of the anger just gets inside you. It's just the way that it is. A friend of mine referred to the food she cooked as love chicken. She says, oh, no, I've got one more ingredient that I always put in. It's love chicken. (laughs) It'll taste really good. You wait and see, you know, and it did. So um, there's, there's something to that when... When we allow ourselves to care in that kind of a deep way and interact with the materials as if they're alive and present with us, they some other quality is evoked from them. I mean, I remember this story, this, um, what was it, what tribe was it? Uh, Seminole, I think. Hmm. Um, this Seminole medicine guy told his son, he said, before you go to pick your medicines, you have to pray to them and tell them what you want them to do. And then when you go to be with them, you must treat them like a human being. And then once more, tell them what you need them to do and ask them to come with you. And so that when you bring your medicines back, they will put forth their best efforts on your behalf and you will not be embarrassed in your medicines. And I just thought that was the greatest thing. And, um, you know, and then, of course, scientists get into it and they start studying plant communication and things like that. But they, you know, one of the things they found is that if a member of a plant community is ill, the plants around them will start making the compounds the other plants need to be healthy. And they send it through the mycelial networks that connect all of the plants in that eco range. But they, the plants also produce the compounds that any living organism in that ecosystem needs to be well. And all animals and insects know how to use and harvest medicinal plants. This is just the way that it is. You know, so chimpanzees, for instance, there's these chimpanzees. So, for instance, they, this chimpanzee has a uh, parasite infection in its bowels, and it's like little worms, and the worms have these, like, kind of mouths with teeth, and they grab onto the bowel wall, and they're sort of, like, sucking nutrients out. And the chimpanzee's going, oh, God, I feel like crap. You, know? it's <laughs> like, uh, you guys go ahead. I'm going to go off and do something. 
So the chimpanzee starts wandering through the forest until it comes to a particular plant, right? Now, this particular plant has sort of like little hooks on the leaves. It looks kind of like Velcro, you know. So the chimpanzee will sit down, and quite often they will sit by a plant and hold a leaf in their mouth for a while. And then they might move on to another one, and they might choose that leaf. And what they're doing is their um, their saliva sort of um, takes in some of the compounds and their body registers actually how strong the compounds are in that leaf. So let's say it's it's the proper one. So what they do is they pick the leaf and they fold it exactly like an accordion. If they chew it up, it won't work. If they swallow it whole, it won't work. They fold it up like an accordion, okay? And then, so it's like a little kind of capsule almost, you know, and then they swallow it. So it goes down, it goes into their stomach, and then it drops down and through the duodenum, and it starts going through the whole GI tract. And as it goes through the GI tract, it unfolds. So it's got, you know, like those sharp lines that accordions have, mm. you know, plus it's got this Velcro stuff. Now, the, um, the bile acids and everything in the, you know, the stomach acids and bile acids, they extract the medicinal compounds from the leaf. And those compounds put all of the parasites on the bowel wall into kind of a coma. Doesn't kill them, but it pretty much knocks them out pretty seriously. And then as the leaf goes through the bowel, it scrapes them all off so that they poop it out. But it will only work if it's folded exactly that way. See. Now, how did the chimpanzees learn to do that? This is a thing that you know really screws up rationalists. They can't explain it. And so, but when you start looking into the animal kingdom, the knowledge of the use of plant medicines and how to prepare them is extremely well established. And so it's not so surprising that we should do that too. So this ties back into how somehow as you immerse yourself more deeply into the field of meaning that we live in, which, you know, we do all the time, we're surrounded by meanings all of the time, a chair it's not just a chair. A chair has um, qualities to it. All chairs are a little different. And if you look at a chair, like you did that restaurant, you go to the chair and you look at it and you go, how does it feel? Now, some chairs are going to feel great and some chairs are not going to feel great, right? If you look at architects that design chairs, most of them don't look good. They don't feel great. They look good. There's a difference. So there's a sort of... Um, an understanding that occurs that you knowledge seems to emerge of its own accord. And so you see, we're really into a non-rational frame of reference here. Now I've spent a lot of time over the last 50 years figuring out how to communicate this stuff. So it doesn't sound, um, <laughs> overly threatening <Yeah. laughs> to people that are, stuck in a rationalist frame, you know, or that only believe in science or whatever. And so that's why in some of my books about this, I'll have 50 or 100 pages yeah. of bibliographical references in yeah. the back, because I can, even within the scientific frame, this stuff is not that, um, it's not strange yeah. in the scientific world. But the thing is, most researchers work does not end up um, percolating down to people because it, it gets stopped at the sort of, by the gatekeepers of the rationalist reductive paradigm. Um, that's why the, there's a whole new group of people called plant neurobiologists that study the plant brain and they really, they're really pissed off because the research has been shown for over a century now about how intelligent plants are and that they move from place to place. Their seeds move in ways that statistics can't explain, that they do all of this amazing stuff and they can't do anything to sort of shift the paradigm that looks at them as insentient uh, organisms. That's been one of my kind of major kind of concerns in, in kind of gathering um, gathering different sources for this book that, I, that I've been called to write is, is like, 
the way in which I write it and, and how to kind of take care of that, that point that you just made of like, you know, uh, the, the, the way in which it's communicated so that it can be right. received. And, and that's kind of, in some sense, it kind of takes away, I feel, um, because you, you need to be like worrying about how it's going to be received. Well, it's both. It's like the, that's the real challenge. Yeah. How can you do both simultaneously? Yeah, yeah. That's where the art and comes in. That's what it took me a long time to learn. And if you start with my first book, like Sacred Plant Medicine, and then you go up through them, getting up to the last one, which is now Earth Grief. Yep. Um, you can see the transition, the uh, the stages of development, how I got more and more facility with it as time went on, and um, it, it's a particular skill base and we're kind of like the way, you know, any kind of minority was in the past, like, you know, women or blacks or whatever, where, you know, being oriented as an animist to the livingness of nature, we're considered to be, uh, a, suffering from inferior intellect and inability to reason. And so there's a huge demand placed on us to be, to actually do it better than the rationalists do it. I mean, we have to be able to think in their frame at least as well as they do, but also be able to think in our frame, which actually encompasses their frame, but theirs cannot encompass ours. And part of the problem when you get into sort of the pagan world or the animist world is that um, the intellectual development is extremely poor. And that's really one of our challenges um, in our time because we're caught between two massive paradigms. The one that has failed, which is that dissect the world into all of its parts and make all these chemicals that we want and control nature, which... If we look around ourselves, we can. I mean, the climate problems we're suffering is a direct outcome of that belief system and its um, engagement with the world as a thing. And this other way that is um, understands holistic systems and nonlinearity, and um, that everything is alive and aware and communicating, even if it communicates in a way strange to us. So that transition is going to be difficult because all of the corporate systems and governments are embedded in that initial frame. And the problem is the whole thing is failing. It's not working. And everybody feels it. There's this kind of generalized climate anxiety and ecological sense of ecological wrongness, really, and that it seems out of control and nobody really knows what to do. You know, the scientists don't know what to do. The government doesn't really know what to do. You know, and, and the media has fairly simplistic stories about what's going on. But really, it's far worse than it's ever being reported. You know, it's really, truly grim. And the we seem unable to correct course. And that's why Greta Thunberg was such a wonderful emergence, because, you know, her Asperger's is extreme. And she can't see any reason to not say stuff the way it really is. And so, which, you know, she became famous, so they all had to sort of like, you know, act like they liked her, but, you know, they don't really. Well, but I think really... that's, sorry to interrupt. I think no, go ahead. this this idea of um, your, your latest work on grief and this kind of active exploration that I've had with grief lately, just, you know, um, through through Mother, um, or through mum, there's a sense of like that that kind of feels now just tying that back into this even you know the idea of the loving the food um right. and like it's it's uh, it seems like there's some point there and um I don't know and even the idea of having to do something in that sense seems to be yeah I don't know something that's well, worth see, it's a exploring weird thing. yeah. When, why, how did we get to the place where we had to make a case that love was important in our work yes, and yes. in our communities? I mean, where did, where did we go so wrong that 
we really had to say like, but you know, this is important. And if you look at it, it's all of our most important human qualities that are the ones that are not talked about. Like everything is economically framed now, like in terms of efficiency, like, oh, well, you know, and if you start realizing that every article you read is going to have some economic reference in it somewhere, like, you know, sick days cost the American uh, economy over $4 trillion a year <laughs> or something like that. I'm like, yeah, but they're sick. <laughs> we have a, that happens to people. And we have, an, we have a, a community structure in this country that only looks at sickness in terms of how much money is lost. What about taking care of people when they're sick? Isn't that what we want to do for our neighbors, our community? What about when we get sick? Do we want people to care about us too? You know, or like, you know, when you see um, just so many things that there's so little caring put into them because they're being done from this sort of efficiency economic thing. And it just doesn't, you know, where, where do, how do we end up there? That's not why we're here. You know, we're here because when we're alive, we're companioning each other on the journey. And that's what we do. That's what the common good is about. That's what conviviality of community is. And so how did we get into a place where we have to justify those things? There's something wrong about that. So, yeah, love is a huge part of all of this. Um, you know, not really in kind of a, you know, a, a, you know like a gooey kind of way, but really just this, this genuine um, caring for the well-being of other things, not just people, but everything around us. And if we extend that caring to our homes, to our farms, to our gardens, to the houses that we build, to the cities that we build, to being able to walk places or the stores or everything else, just imagine what that's like. People feel better then. You know, when people go into therapy, you know, because I worked as a psychotherapist for a long time, when people go to therapy, then they they almost never come in and say, I want to think better. They all say, I want to feel better. And that's why James Hillman, the great Jungian um, psychotherapist, said, you know, the healing environment is actually the actual environment. You know, it's the outdoors. Yeah. In a healthy ecosystem, if somebody goes into a healthy forest, they feel better always. Automatically, yeah. Automatically. And so now everybody's like, you know, prescribing forest bathing. They got it from the Japanese. Yeah. You know, like, but why did we need a bunch of studies to tell us that a walk in the forest would help us feel better? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me either. So we, we gave it up, and then the scientists and the researchers tell us it's okay. But, you know, we have to get a note from our doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you've got great, there was two great environmentalists who wrote about this stuff from Australia, and both of them have died in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was Deborah Bird Rose, and the other one was Val Plumwood. And I've gotten all their material that I could possibly find. And their whole focus was on exactly these things we've been talking about. And they helped extend some of my thinking in some quite wonderful directions. So I highly recommend. I wish their work was better known. They're just, they were just marvelous people. Yeah, I'll definitely definitely have a look at, look at their work. Um, yeah, it seems like we've kind of gone through quite a bit in this chat i was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the foundation for guy and studies and um what that is all about and what the vibe of 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 that project is well we put together um there was just um a few of us that got together oh lord um probably 35 years ago maybe now 
and uh, realized this is what we were doing and focusing on. And the concept of Gaia was it had been around, but you know, there's a lot of problems with that too because the word Gaia is uh, is an animist phrase, really animist word, and it upset a lot of uh, scientists. And uh, but nevertheless, that concept of the Earth as a living, intelligent organism was it came from the Greeks, of course, and a lot of good things did come from the Athenians. And so, uh, since my focus was really on the earth and this sort of animist way of being and the whole Gaia concept was stimulating interest in whole system science rather than separate disciplines that and we wanted a 501c3 or a nonprofit sort of status we created that all those years ago to sort of hold the um, to be the umbrella under which we worked and uh, um, so that's that's sort of what that is, and um, so and if people want to see my work or that work, they can go to uh, stephenherodbuner.com, and that's also got links to the foundation and sort of the its focus. Yeah, great. I, I, yeah, I've been kind of feeling into this, and I'm not really sure how to express it, but um, I I know that when you were kind of in your late 20s, you spent some time kind of around Robert Bly and just kind of asking questions. And I think I even heard you mention that some of the ideas didn't really um, begin to blossom for another 12 or so years at certain points. Oh, yeah, the guy was really irritating. Yeah. <laughs> he was, I mean, he was had a, um, a photographic memory and he was... So he would talk for several hours with no notes, I can't do that. Um, I wander off on all kinds of side roads, you know. But uh, he'd known 40 or 50 poems by heart that he would use and talk. And so when I first went to see him in 79, um, I was 27 then. And uh, so he had been working a long time with the poems of Kabir. And, you know, he put together the Kabir book, which is one of his best-selling books of these translated around 40 poems, I guess. And uh, so he's working with this one poem, and he said, uh, he said, uh, and this just this one couple of lines, he goes, uh, he's given this long talk, and he's using the poem as an example, and then the poem says, in this one part, it says, uh, the truth is, you turned away and went into the dark alone, and that's why everything that you do has some strange failure in it. You know, and then he just stops. And I'm like, yeah. God, I know, I know what that feels like. It kind of feels familiar. And then he pauses as the whole line drops into the room. And then he says, hey, you won't really be able to understand this until you're at least 40. And I was like really mad. Yeah, of course I can understand. I can understand anytime I want. I'm really smart. I'm really, you know, dedicated and I'll understand this, you know. And then so irritatingly enough, about 15 years later, it dawned on me everything you've been talking about. <laughs> what, what a dick, you know. <laughs> but there's a certain thing to be said for um, maturity, you know, that, um, you know, he was always trying to talk about this mentoring dynamic without getting into sort of a hierarchical thing. And he would talk about it in terms of, verticality after a while but that the young men he was the kind of elder i'd been looking for all of my life so and young men need male elders because there's this transmission that goes from the elder to the younger man it's sort of this relay race of soul that's been going on as long as people have been and there's some in substance it comes off the surface of the man's body that the young man takes in, and it helps them to orient themselves and to understand um, what it means to be an older male, you know. And that's, you know, what I got from him. And I studied his work for, oh, I still study his work. Um, 
I have a massive collection of a lot of his more obscure pieces and um but he's somebody that sort of helped me orient myself and he was doing it with poetry the things we were talking about here he was focused on doing it with poetry starting in the late 50s because he thought most poetry was really terrible and which it still is and um but my focus is doing it with um something else really that with our the way we live yeah. and create and um and inhabit ourselves and, and the earth itself you know yeah what comes up for me is coming back into like i've i've started doing this chanting um experimentation recently and it's sometimes i chant and sing and all that kind of stuff and then other times it's really connected back into what we were speaking towards earlier with the real feeling and then yeah. i feel like no matter what it sounds like that that literal vibration goes into people and um there is something that happens in that process and there's also this idea of kind of i guess looking at the time ahead of us and um you know the whole thing about time is quite interesting as well but almost like presencing ourselves for that kind of um for what's what's kind of emerging i guess and to to have some kind of a um connection with that that whole process um yeah well, we're in a difficult time it's not we're not going to get out of this <laughs> very easily and a lot of things are going to have to change because the virtual world that our civilization is created on top of the real world, the earth itself, there isn't enough of a, of a, of a congruent relationship between the virtual world and the real world itself. And the real world itself is the ecosystems of the entire planet are starting to destabilize because too many of the parts have been removed. Plus, um, the synthetic chemicals that have been released, you know, there's uh, 90 or 100,000 of them um, that are constant pretty much everywhere now. And those all have um, biological activity. So releasing all of those things um, into the environment, they're affecting all biological organisms. And they're affecting us exactly the same. You know, when pharmaceuticals, when we take pharmaceuticals, um, and most people do, you take them, let's say, three times a day or two times a day or whatever, but you have to keep taking them. That's because your body doesn't, it's not like a food that it can use. The pharmaceuticals in most instances force the body into a certain range of behavior that... Um, medical researchers have determined is healthy. So if your blood pressure is high, it forces it lower, for instance, or whatever. And so, but the body goes, ah, what's this? I don't know. And it excretes it out. You piss it and poop it out, right? And then you have to take more. But that stuff that goes into the waste stream, it's not biodegradable, except under really limited circumstances. And because our physiology is similar to the physiology of every other life form on this planet, those substances, when they go out into the world, they affect every other living organism. So you've got this, not only agricultural chemicals are um, industrial chemicals, but you've got pharmaceutical chemicals, all of which are affecting physiology of every life form on the planet. And these are pervasive. They've been produced in the trillions of tons, and they don't go away. And no water treatment plants filter them out. They don't even test for most of them. And so we've got this sort of uncontrolled experiment going on, which we're all sort of guinea pigs <laughs> in it. Hmm. And, you know, it's destabilizing everything, not just the cutting of trees or mining or whatever that's going on or even the CO2 that's increasing um, atmospheric temperature. So we've got this whole dynamic where 
Earth ecosystems are destabilizing. Everybody can feel it. We know something's wrong. We want the government, the leaders in charge to do something sensible, which they won't for all the reasons we know. And so um, everybody's kind of scared, you know. And I think a lot of the politicians are scared, too. They don't really know what to do either. And so everybody's sort of seizing on whatever thing they think will keep them safe, you know. Mm. Um, you know, if we, like, if we keep out immigrants, we'll be safe. You know, and one of my jokes is that, you know, the conservatives really hate immigrant people, but the liberals really hate immigrant plants, you know. They hate invasive species, you know. So like, one way or another, we got to keep all of those aliens out of here, you know. But it's like this sort of, we seize on stuff, or we, you know, if only everybody does this, or if only everybody believes that, or if only yeah. whatever. It's almost like and, everything's exponentially speeding up, and playing that game of speeding up to try to combat it is right. almost like, right. it seems like the opposite approach of what might be beneficial is like the, the idea of maybe slowing down and coming back into that love space. Um, well, you basically have to look at what the problem is and then decide to do something different. And corporate entities, they exist because of what's being done. They don't want to do anything different. The very rich, they make their money that way. They don't want to do anything different. So there's a lot of forces in play. You know, it's kind of like... Uh, Macbeth. Macbeth, everybody told him what to do, but his um, his particular character that he had did not allow him to do what was sensible. Yeah. It's kind of a part of the human tragedy, really. Yeah. Just like. So people feel all this stuff mm. and they don't know what to do. And so everybody's a bit hysterical and, and running around. And, you know, there's a chance for uh, war certainly because people are afraid and they don't know what to do and um, systems are crashing and you know I mean the horrible wildfires that Australia had those were just some of the most horrendous stories I've ever read and we're having them in the western United States here too yeah so we're in difficult times and the real question is how do we make our way through this period of time and you know one of the things I talk about in the, the book Earth Grief is uh, Jacques Cousteau because I years and years like 30 years ago at least <laughs> I saw him being interviewed in a television program and he was talking about the Cousteau Society and all of the work he'd done with the oceans and everything and there was a young woman interviewing him in his boat and she said well do you think that, that you'll win and he got this weirdest look on his face, as if she was suddenly speaking, you know, some strange language he didn't understand. And, and then finally he went, one doesn't do it because one thinks one will win. One does it because one must. Yeah. And he said it in a simple way. just like, oh, I'm going to have hamburger for dinner. You know, it's like there was no grandiosity, no... He wasn't caught up in the pain of what was happening to the oceans. He's just going, oh, this is the way they are, and this is what I'm doing now, right? And he figured out on his own what to do. He didn't get permission from anybody. He didn't have somebody tell him what it was. It was his own individual genius that led him to figure out what he could do. Mm -hmm. And that's the way ecosystems work, actually, when the earth is experiencing a destabilization or an ecosystem is an impulse is sent into the ecosystem, which is sort of a gestalt of the problem. And all of the organisms in that ecosystem begin to respond. The plants begin to make different chemical structures and um, groupings and things begin to shift as they begin to solve the problem, it's never a top-down process. It's always bottom-up. And so, you know, you see all of these people that are coming up with amazing solutions to things, and all of them are outside the system because the system is not going to accept widely divergent solutions. So people are creating new kinds of farming, new kinds of medicine, new kind, all, all different kinds of things. 
And that's what's really fascinating about it, because if you've got a, you know, 100 million people coming up with these massively innovative things, that's a lot better than having 12 guys, you know, in a computer lab coming up with it. You know, I mean, like, you know, I think uh, they were trying to figure out what was it? Uh, it was AIDS researchers or something. They were trying to figure out how this certain protein was folding so that they could um, work with it in the lab and they couldn't figure it out. So they put it out on the gamer network, which had about 300,000 people on it. They solved it in like 10 days, <laughs> but these guys have been working on it for like years. You know? So I have a lot of faith in people like you and Greta Thunberg and just all of the people that feel something's awry and they're letting some other kind of awareness and intelligence burst forth in them because we're not that different than elephants, you know, or anything else. When, you know, elephants feel a tsunami coming, they all start heading for higher ground while most of the people are standing around going, what, what, and, you know, because that part of them has been atrophied. They don't pay attention. But the those of us who are feeling these things and deciding to listen to it, we're kind of the elephants heading for higher ground in yeah. response yeah. to what's coming. And so that's why it's, you know, we're ecological beings on an ecological planet. That doesn't change. We've got, you know, millions of years of evolutionary wisdom in our body. And really, when you get into it, our bodies are composed of very sophisticated forms of bacteria, really. And that goes all the way back four and a half billion years to the origins of life on this planet. There's a lot of wisdom in each one of us. And so it makes a lot of sense to trust that and see where it can go rather than completely relying on a science, a reductive science that's only really a couple hundred years old. I mean, if a, you know, if a bristlecone pine that lives 5,000 years if it only does this important ecological thing once every thousand years, science will never see it. There's an aspen grove that's over 100,000 years old that covers over 100 acres. It's one of the most intelligent neural networks on the planet. If it does something only every 10,000 years, scientists will never see it. And bacteria cover the entire Earth in a membrane, they act pretty much as if they're one functioning unit. They're actually the largest neural network on the planet. And if they do something only every million years, scientists will never see it. There's a lot going on here that that approach can never find. But people can. So Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize for her work on corn transposons, she said, I went no place that the corn did not first tell me to go. She said, you know, I can, I get down with them. They're individuals, you know, they're just like my children. And they'll tell me all kinds of things. And I can actually, when I look, I can actually see their genome rearranging itself. And so she started talking about this, how DNA was a, how the genome was a flexible organ of the cell in the 50s and at that time everybody believed it was static it was like a program of some sort and she was ostracized she wasn't allowed to publicly speak again for over 20 years nobody would talk to her they all thought she was crazy they'd say well you know i i appreciate her research but i don't like her mysticism she said it's not mysticism this is real science and so she kept at it, and then she wins the Nobel Prize for her work with corn transposons, and that's when everybody started going, yeah, you know, I liked her all, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hung out. I knew her from way back, you know. But the thing is, she was doing a very specific form of holistic science, which can perceive connections and behaviors that reductive science can't. 
And indigenous cultures, they all develop that kind of science themselves to various degrees, like the Polynesians who settled all of the uh, Pacific islands they would sail to islands a thousand miles away that they'd never been to before. And they had a very well established um, way of um, navigating that didn't use anything that the Western world used in their navigational orientation. It was very different, but it worked for them. And they've been reclaiming that they were forced to quit using it um, by missionaries and, the governments that took over their islands, but they're reclaiming it now, and it's uh, it's rather astonishing stuff. So I think there's, you know, part of the real hope I have, which is not optimism, it's hope is a kind of faith in life itself, really, mm. is that there's this capacity within the human species to adapt in the in the most important way possible to change our own climate of mind, our own orientation, so that we can once again become Earth itself, that we re-inhabit our inner being. And there's this other kind of way of doing science and thinking that still retains our most human qualities. And that as you do it, love is enhanced, ethics is enhanced, moral behavior is enhanced, because they're naturally a part of that way of being in relationship to the world. All indigenous cultures were aware of that. Polynesian navigators are. And so um, that's what I have faith in, this capacity that we have and that of so many people that are feeling the need to return there and are doing amazing things. Yeah. I guess I I wanted to kind of ask, I've got this, I've been kind of longing for a mentor myself and I feel as though this has been almost tied in with a lot of things with my past, but also the point that I'm at. And yeah, I just, I realize that you're kind of in this space where like you mentioned, you're kind of moving into this process of the end of life. And I was I was wondering if there's any chance at all in some small way that we could stay connected and because um, this is really what the kind of work that I'm called to do and I found it really kind of synchronistic that it perfectly aligns with the words that you've written in, in a different way. Yeah. Um, so I was just... So sure, sure you can, you can write and we'll talk. Thank you. And that and I'll see as you know, as as I have the energy. Yeah. Because I am um um in the ending time. I don't live in forward time so much anymore like everybody does. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm coming to the end of my time here and um that's sort of where I'm oriented, but also this work has been what I do and I will do it as long as I can. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to share yeah, deep appreciation for everything that you've shared today and, and just to kind of just send some reverence to, you know, the countless amount of space that you've provided for this. And um, yeah. Thank yeah. You, Mike. yeah. Yeah. So, and thank you for having me on and for doing this podcast. And um, I look forward to it when you post it. Yeah, me too. Me too. Okay, good. All right. Well, okay. um, I guess I'll let you get on with your day and, and yeah, I think that's probably a good place okay. to close things All down. Right. Blessings. All okay. right. Be well. Bye. Sending a loving breeze of gratitude in your direction. Thank you so much for sharing space with us here and now. And if you want some more information about our guest, you can head over to todaydreamer.com and check it, check out the episode section on the page. Um, also, if you're someone that's interested in deepening your practice of presence, if you want to work together with someone to structure 
a spiritual practice, whether it's an existing one or a new one. Uh, if you're looking to build consistency, uh, define your ambition and recalibrate your trajectory in a way that's more in line with wholeness and in a way that contributes and participates more fully in the emergent world story and its blossoming, then feel free to get in touch because I'm taking on a small handful of one-on-one -on -one clients, spiritual friends, um, and I'd love to speak to you. If you did enjoy this episode and you felt like you got something out of it, feel free to share it with your community. And if you feel like there's anyone in particular that could benefit from the space shared today, uh, I would really appreciate if you'd pass it on to them. And I'm sure they would too. And yeah, uh, I'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you again, my friend, and be well.